Well, wonderful to be with you this morning as in the fall uh, we are exploring together as a people what does it mean to cast our light, to be sent out on mission by the Lord Jesus in order to put on display who Jesus is and His redemptive message of salvation, which is a call for all to turn and repent and cling to Jesus for life. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then also on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And He says, therefore, shine your light that people may see your good deeds and their eyes will be lifted up that they would give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And as we've been doing that, we've been exploring this theme in what is called the mission discourse in Matthew chapter 10, and today we're actually going to be looking at what is the introduction to the mission discourse, which is found at the very end of Matthew chapter 9. And part of the reason we're doing a little bit out of order is to a certain extent our sermon series here in the fall is following, following along with a small group series that uh, was produced by the discipleship ministry and is being used in small groups and as well as in family ministries, student ministries as well. And as we follow along, that means we might be a little bit of out of order, and, uh, but hopefully we'll be blessed this morning. In fact, what we'll be doing in a way is exploring what does it mean as we just heard our wonderful choir sing the words that we hear In Isaiah chapter 6, who will go? Who will go for us? And the prophet is saying, here am I, send me. What does that mean for us? How can that be the cry of our heart this morning? And so our reading is Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35. So I invite you to stand. As we read this together, we stand in honor of the Word of God, and we stand in honor of its reading, starting in verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When He saw the crowds, He had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then He said to His disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into His harvest. Though the grass withers and the flower fades, the Word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the Scriptures. We thank You that You have revealed Yourself, Your heart, in and through Your Word to us, Your people. We pray this morning that, Holy Spirit, You'd be present in this place that You would open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, because apart from You, we're blind, we're deaf, we don't understand. But in and because of You, we see, we hear, we do understand, and then we turn and we're healed. We pray You'd do that work in us through the Holy Spirit this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning's message is entitled, Love the Lost. And what we see in the end of Matthew chapter 9 is a revelation of the heart of Jesus as He is then sending out the disciples on mission, which is furthered and expanded in the encouragement and instruction that we find in Matthew chapter 10. And as we get a picture into the heart of Jesus, sending out His apostles on mission, so He sends us, we see that the heart of God undergirded in mission is built upon a foundation, and it's built upon the foundational practice of prayer, that prayer is foundational in our sending as workers in the Lord's harvest field. And as we are sent out upon a foundation of prayer, we also see the heart 
of Jesus as he says that when he looks at the crowds, he looks at them with compassion. And so we'll see this. We are built upon a foundational practice of prayer, but we are sent out with a heart of compassion, and we are sent out. And if we are sent out, then that means by implication, Jesus is sending us to be present in the world. So we have a foundational practice of prayer, which then moves within us a heart of compassion as we are sent out to be present in the world for Jesus. So you see, as Jesus is talking to His disciples, He tells them that they are to be people of prayer. When He looks at the people and He sees that they are helpless, He tells His disciples to pray earnestly. Pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into the harvest. And as Jesus is saying this and calling on the disciples to pray in this way, right in the beginning of the next verse in chapter 10, He sends them out. And so just as Jesus sends out the apostles on mission, guess who He's sending out on mission today? You and me. And so as He's sending us out on mission, what does it mean to say that that mission is undergirded and built upon a foundation of prayer? One thing that prayer is, and prayer is many things, is an expression of our dependence upon God. We pray because we are dependent upon the Lord. In all things, did not the Lord Jesus instruct His disciples in what we call the Lord's Prayer? He says, give us this day our daily bread. Part of what Jesus is meaning is that all of our life, all that our sustenance, all what it means to live before God is dependent upon Him. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me what I need because I am at every moment dependent upon you, and every good and perfect gift comes from you. And this is especially true when it comes to mission. The effectiveness and the outcome of the sending of Jesus on mission is not first and foremost dependent upon you and me. It's dependent upon God. Let's remind ourselves of something we said last week. In Acts chapter 16, the apostle Paul is proclaiming the gospel, and it says he's proclaiming the gospel to a crowd that had gathered, and in the midst of that crowd, there was a woman whose name was Lydia. And it says in the text that Lydia's heart was opened, and it was opened by who? Paul? By Lydia? It was opened by who? God. That the Lord opened Lydia's heart, and that as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit upon the person of Lydia, Lydia then, it says, pays attention to the words that are spoken by Paul. And implicitly, she's paying attention, and she is receiving the message of which Paul is proclaiming to all that had gathered there, but the effectiveness of the proclamation of the Apostle Paul was not because the Apostle Paul had a quick turn of phrase. It's because the Lord opened the heart of Lydia to receive. So in that way, as we are sent on mission to proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom of God, we do so as well, wholly and completely dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit to work within and through us as agents into the hearts of those that we love and care for and who we are proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom. But let's remind ourselves, prayer is first and foremost about dependence. One pastor, H.B. Charles, puts it well. He says this, prayer is arguably the most objective measurement of our dependence upon God. Think of it this way, he says. The things that you pray about are the things you trust God to handle. The things that you neglect to pray about are the things that you trust that you can handle on your own. Ouch. 
This hit me when I read this this week. It also rang very true. There's a situation that Carrie and I were facing over the last number of weeks, which was a situation that had a, the potential to be very damaging in our lives. But it was also a situation that was out of our control. And that was walking through that. It was so striking and hit so close to home how much of our life is out of our control. I mean, isn't the idea that we can control our lives and control the world around us, isn't that an illusion? And doesn't the Lord at times, and for our good, bring that more forcibly to home than we like to show us, oh, I really don't have control? And what it did in our lives is it forced us to the place where we should always be anyway, which is on our knees, praying to God, because God is the one who, when things seem out of control to us, are they out of control to God? So we go to God because we are wholly dependent on Him. And how much of our lives are we dependent upon God? 50 percent? 60? 75? You cannot take a breath. Your heart does not beat once apart from the ongoing will of God. If God did not will for your heart to beat one more time, it would not. Interesting that the Apostle Paul, when he talks about prayer, he says, pray without ceasing. Rejoice in hope. Be constant in prayer. Be patient in tribulation. One thing that we can say as we bring this to bear on the idea of mission is this thought that when we go on mission, we are sent on mission to represent Jesus, to be an ambassador for Christ. In other words, we are going to talk to other people about God, yes? So if we're going to say that our mission is undergirded on a foundation of prayer, then would it not be the case that we shouldn't talk to someone about God until we first talk to God about them? We bring people to God. We bring people to the cross, and we say, Lord, work within the heart of this person because I recognize that if this person is going to respond to the life-giving message of the gospel, it's because you have opened their heart to receive and you have opened their heart to respond. So, Lord, do the work that only your Holy Spirit can do. And when we begin to pray in that way, we pray with expectation, expectation that the Lord will answer, because the Scriptures promise that when we pray according to the will of God, God hears us. This is a dangerous prayer to pray, because when you begin to pray in this way, Lord, open up opportunities for me to share my faith. He will answer you. And all of a sudden you're going, oh, now, yes, now. Are we praying? Are we burdened for people in our lives? And are we bringing them to God? Because if we aren't bringing them to God, then we're trusting we can do it on our own. We aren't living in dependence upon Him. We're living in dependence upon ourselves. And the Scriptures say, salvation is of the Lord. So as we are sent on mission on the foundation of prayer, we are also sent with a certain heart posture, a certain heart posture towards the world that we are sent into, and that heart posture is one of compassion. Compassion, like love in the Scriptures, is not simply a warm, fuzzy feeling in our hearts. Of course, compassion and love can be and often is a warm, fuzzy feeling. But at its root, these words biblically are action words. They are things within us that move us and propel us forward in order to act on other people's behalf. The Scriptures, even as we saw earlier in our worship and was from 1 John, look, if you have the goods of the world and you see your brother and sister in need but you don't actually help them, do you love them? I mean, imagine this. Imagine you see someone drowning in the water, and you say, Lord bless you, I'll pray for you. 
and walk away when a life preserver is ready to hand. Do you really have compassion upon the person struggling in the water? And so it is with the gospel. We see, when Jesus saw the crowds, He had compassion because He saw that they were harassed and they were helpless because they were as sheep without a shepherd, it says. So He had compassion. This language of a sheep without a shepherd is looking into the Hebrew Scriptures that often describe the people as sheep. One most famous example is from Ezekiel the prophet, 34, where it says there that the people were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they were food as for the wild beasts. The Lord says that my sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth with none to search and none to seek for them. This is the heart of the Lord Jesus as He looks into the crowds. And notice what the Lord says just a number of verses later. He says, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. I will rescue them. That the Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth, says that that they are sheep as without a shepherd and I myself will come to rescue them. And let's remind ourselves that Jesus is fully man, but Jesus is also fully God. Jesus is God who has come to rescue His sheep because He has compassion, because He sees that they are harassed and helpless. And so when we look out into the world that we would have the same heart posture as our Lord Jesus, to look into the world not with the view of condemnation, but with the view of compassion. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul talks about this heart posture using the language of love and love and compassion, both these action words to propel us forward on mission. And he says in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, the love of Christ controls us. Some translations say the love of Christ constrains us. What does it mean to be constrained? Almost like you're hemmed in. Imagine being in a situation where something's pressing you to the left, something pressing you to the right, something pressing you behind, and all you can do is move one way. That's what, this lang- that's what the language in the Greek is saying. I'm hemmed in. I'm, I'm forced in one direction. It controls me. It constrains me. For the love of Christ propels me this way into mission, into the world. Why? Because I am convinced of this. I've concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. Here the apostle is saying that the death of Jesus implicates all of humanity. Every man, every woman, every child, every person that's ever been born, the death of Jesus is an impl- has an implication for all of them. So I am convinced I'm sent out into the world because the message is for everyone. Why? That those who live might no longer live for themselves. See, the message of the gospel is a message that demands a response. We preach to everyone. We proclaim to everyone. No one is left out. And those who the Lord opens the heart respond that they may no longer live for themselves, but for the sake of Him who died and was raised for them. And yet, if we're honest, if I'm honest with you, sometimes our heart for the world is not one of compassion. Is that fair? And this is where we need to have a foundational practice of prayer. Because through Scripture, we see different people who also do not have a heart of compassion like God. There's a prophet in the Old Testament who famously does not have a heart of compassion like the Lord. What's his name? Starts with a J. Jonah. Good old Jonah. Jonah did not share the heart of God for the world. If Jonah was sent to be a prophet to his own people, I imagine Jonah would be like, oh, sign me up. 
In fact, we have record in the Hebrew Scriptures that Jonah was a prophet to his own people and probably was effectively so. But when Jonah is sent to people not like him, to people who had persecuted him, the Assyrians, the people who were brutal, the people who, quote, don't deserve it, Jonah said, no way, Jose. I will go as far away from you as I possibly can because I'm not going to those people. At the end of Jonah in chapter 4, after Jonah has preached the worst sermon in history and the people respond, now why do the people respond to the worst sermon in history? Who opens the heart? God. Your call is to be faithful. God is responsible for the results. Jonah is up on a hill, and God provides for him a plant. And this plant comforts Jonah because the sun is beating down upon him, and the plant provides him with shade. It's nice. And then God takes away the plant. And what's Jonah's response? I'm angry enough to die. And then God says this to his prophet, you're all upset about the plant. I'm upset about the people. He says, Jonah, you pity the plant. I pity the people. You see, Jonah's loves are disordered. Jonah's priorities do not match the priorities of God. He's more concerned with the plant than he is with the people. Can that be true of you and me? Can we say, Lord, yes, your message is for everyone, just not them. Don't use me to send to them. And who could that be? We could take turns coming up and you could share who's the them for you. That'd be fun. Who is the them? Well, you know, everyone deserves the grace of God, but please don't send me to LGBTQ people. I want nothing to do with them. They're gross. I don't like it. Let me ask you a question. Does God love them? Are they broken? Is there pain there? Do they need the love of Christ? Do they need the gospel? The only way they're going to hear the gospel is someone tells them. The only way they're going to see the love of Christ on display is if the love of Christ is put on display for them. Maybe it's someone who's different from you politically or has a different view on some issue than you. Maybe it's a different faith. Maybe it's a different people. It's a different culture. You know, one thing that's interesting, we're just talking out loud. Right now, there are more people displaced in history now more than ever. You know, that's an opportunity. Why would that be an opportunity? I mean, I mean, think that just, just take one people group. Let's just take the Muslim people group. One of the most difficult things about sharing the gospel with Muslims is the power of the Muslim community. If you are going to become a Christian, I'm sorry, if you're going to be a Christian and become a Muslim, do Muslims care about that? And let's say someone here was to become a Muslim, you know, would, we'd probably say, man, that's what's wrong, you know, but we probably wouldn't try to kill them. But for Muslims that seek to become Christians, do we know how much that costs them? Do we even get close to understanding the cost of that? So here in our world today, there are many, many Muslims who are being displaced all over the world, many of them right in our backyard. We have lots and lots of the Muslim community here in our backyard. And we have a unique opportunity to share Jesus with them. You don't have to go to Jordan anymore. You don't have to go to Lebanon anymore. You don't have to go to Saudi Arabia anymore. You can drive 25 miles. It's right down there. Let me ask you a question. Does Jesus love them? Did Jesus die for them? Did Jesus die for them? If we don't tell them, who's going to? 
And there might be something within you that goes, yeah, not me though, not me, no, not me. You can send someone else. Okay, Jonah. Okay, Jonah. I'm not saying everybody's sent to go 25 times down to Dearborn. I'm not saying everybody's called to do that. But should we all have a heart of compassion for that? Yes. And if you don't, pray. Is the Lord, can the Lord change your heart? Do you want the Lord to change your heart? In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is talking about uh, one of his fellow workers named Titus. It's actually one of the books that Paul wrote, Titus, but this is 2 Corinthians. And it talks about the love of God being poured into the heart of Titus. It says there that, but thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. You know, one person I know, if if you know um, uh, Mark and uh, Mary Jane, Mark and Mary Jane Vanderput. Do you know Mark and Mary Jane Vanderput? Some of you may know them. I have never met anyone who loved Muslims more than him yet. There might be someone else out there. Wow, whoever that would be. Mark loves Muslims more than I do. I love Muslims, but he loves them more than I do. Lord, may you change my heart to be like Mark's. Make my heart like his. I've never seen anybody so display the love of Christ than Mark. Make me like him. You know what I'm talking about, Brian? You, have you ever seen anybody like him? It's unbelievable what he does. I'm over there. We're in Lebanon together. I'm looking at this beautiful sunset. You know what Mark's doing? He's talking to people about Jesus walking along the road. I couldn't believe it. I said, Mark, look at the sunset. He's like, I got something else a little bit more important. You pity the plant. I pity the people. So we are sent out into the world. So we undergirded the practice of prayer to have compassion, because Jesus had compassion to be present. Jesus specifically says in Matthew chapter 9, pray that people would be sent out into the harvest field. And the Lord this morning for all of us is saying, I'm sending you out into the harvest. You know, sometimes as believers, we can kind of get into this place where we might call it like, uh, anyone ever live in a cul-de-sac? You know, it's like a Christian cul-de-sac. You just hang out with people in your cul-de-sac. You know, it's like everything just happens right there. And by the way, what I don't want to do in any way is not Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship is huge. Jesus says that I've redeemed you to myself and you're now a part of a family. And We gather together as believers, we have community on Wednesday nights, we do small groups, we have classes. These are all wonderful things. We need Christian community. It's part of our mission. We bear one another's burdens. We weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. Yes. But if all we do is spend time in our holy huddles and we never leave to go out, if we never go into the harvest, then are we really being obedient? And where is God calling us to be present in the world? And by, 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 as I say that, you know, it's funny, in the last service, everyone left, I think everyone's kind of like wouldn't look me in the eyes, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody's worse at this than pastors. So I, I implicate myself first. Maybe Pastor Tweedy first. No, me. <laughs> Actually, Brian's probably better about this than most. How easy is it to come to church every day, sit in my office, read books, and come out on Sunday mornings and go back in my office again? I can do that all week. In other words, I, I, as much as anyone else, cannot be out in the world. I cannot go out. I can simply be in, and I can use all the justifications that I want in order to make an excuse myself to not be out. But God has called me, and God has called all of us to be sent out into the world. And we're sent out into the world to be a witness for Jesus. Now, as we're a witness to Jesus, we're a witness to Jesus, for Jesus, with people that are different than us, with people who don't see the world the same way that we do. And we bear witness to who Jesus is. Jesus did this. Earlier on in Matthew chapter 9, which is our reading today, Matthew is hanging out with a guy named, Jesus is hanging out with a guy named Matthew. 
Get that right? Matthew was what? What was Matthew's vocation? He was a tax collector. Were tax collectors well thought of? No. Why? One, they worked for the Romans, and two, they had a common practice of taking more than what they were owed. What did they do with the extra? Put it in their pockets. Life was good. And so they were thieves, many of them, and so they were not popular. And Jesus calls Matthew to be his disciple, then he goes to Matthew's home, and he's hanging out with Matthew and hanging out with Matthew's friends, which were tax collectors and sinners. How well did this go over? He's reclining at the table. He's having fellowship with tax collectors and sinners. He's having fellowship with people who believe in alternate lifestyles and a a bunch of people on the other side of the political aisle from you who see life very different than you. They're pro-choice and I don't know what else, pro whatever. I hate to go to specifics. They're different than you. He's hanging out with them. And the Pharisees, the religious people, come up and they go, hey, this is cool. This is what God meant all along. Great. That's all. Can I join you? He says, what's wrong with you? You're hanging out with all the wrong people. You're hanging out with the convicts. You're hanging out with the people who have rap sheets. Hanging out with people who don't dress the right way. And Jesus responds to them how? Hey, you're right. I'm sorry. I'll get back in line. I'll get back in my holy huddle and I'll move back into the cul-de-sac. Forgive me. He says, no. Look, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. We are sent into the world because people are broken and they're hurting and they need the message of the gospel. And if we don't go, no one's going to hear. Go and learn what this means, he says, and he quotes Hosea 6. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. I desire compassion. The Lord is merciful. He's compassionate. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Go and learn this means. That's my true character. That's the character of the Lord. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I came to call not the righteous, but sinners. What is the priority to God? That you tithe a tenth of your herbs? Remember Jesus says this to the religious leaders? You tithe a tenth of your dill and your mint and your cumin, and yet you neglect what? the weightier matters of the law. You have disordered loves because you have placed plants over people. And my heart is for people. So as we close, let's just remind ourselves, if they aren't going to hear from us, who are they going to hear it from? How then can they call on Him who they've never believed? And how can they believe in whom They've never heard. And how can they hear without a herald? Now, in the original, this is taken from the ESV, in the original it says, how can they hear without a preacher? And I changed that, which is okay, it's all right, don't worry. The word probably means closer to herald than preacher anyway. But it says, and how will they hear without a preacher? When I read that, you read that in Romans 10, you're like, oh good, we got one, he's up there in front. How can they hear without a preacher? Well, good, we pay him, so he does it. Isn't that sometimes the mistake that we make? Lord, it's okay. I don't have to do it. They'll do it. It doesn't have to be a preacher. It could be them. It's those guys. It's all... Someone else. Remember what Isaiah says from the Lord, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I. And we said right at the opening of this message, how can we live further into the heart of Isaiah? Here I am, Lord, send me. So as we close, I want you, or let's together, think about who God has placed in your life that would be a burden to share Jesus with them. I want you to spend just a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, 
who have you placed in my heart, in my life? That would be a burden to share Jesus with them. And then, even right now, you got, you got someone coming to mind? Maybe two? If not, get out, you know. It's all right. And then, as we said, we don't want to go to them to talk about God before we've done what? We want to talk to God about them first. So we're going to spend just a moment doing that now. And to pray for opportunities that the Lord would open up for you to begin to share and demonstrate the kingdom. And demonstration may say, Lord, help me have opportunities not simply to speak about Christ, yes, speak about Him, but actually be moved to bless them, to be the hands and feet of Jesus for them. And when we pray this way, I believe, and I'm sure you believe along with me, God will provide those opportunities. So let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we don't want to pray for others first before we thank You that You loved us, that while we were weak, enemies, ungodly, as You say, one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If we think someone else doesn't deserve it, we don't first. Thank You for our salvation. Thank You for Your compassion to us. And Lord, we pray that You would use us as vessels, conduits of Your compassion to others. And Lord, right now, in the quietness of our heart, I pray You would bring to mind, and as You probably already have, one or two, three, a, a few, that You would say, Holy Spirit, You want us to be burdened to pray for them. Lord, would You do that work now, and we bring them before You in our own words. We pray for them now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that they're in our lives. Thank you. Thank you that you love them. Lord, help me to love them the way you do. Lord, open up opportunities to share and demonstrate. Lord, we thank You that salvation is from the Lord and that we are simply faithful participants. It's Your mission field. We are simply laborers who are sent out to work in it. And so we pray, Lord, that You would open up hearts, first and foremost our own, but open up hearts to receive and to respond to the message of the salvation that is by Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and reconciliation with God by faith. Lord, give us those opportunities to rejoice with the angels as everyone who turns to Jesus prompts a heavenly party. Give us that opportunity here on earth to celebrate that as well. We trust You. We lean upon You and depend upon You in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.